What does the military action in Syria mean for the markets, and what does it mean for oil? What's up, everybody? Welcome aboard to Bubba's Bottom Line. And as always, it's great to be here. Although for most of us, the weather has been <laughs> the worst. In Chicago, it's about uh, 33 and snowing, so it's pretty ugly out there. And of course, anybody who watched the Cubs game on Saturday, <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a wild game, but it was nasty weather. But uh, of course, over the weekend, we've had some uh, military action, some uh, missile strikes in uh, Syria. And of course, uh, both sides are declaring victory. Uh, but in the meantime, I guess the real question is, what does it mean for the markets and what does it mean for oil? Uh, I think for the markets, it doesn't mean uh, a heck of a lot either way. I think the markets are at a, a key spot here as to whether they're going to break out to the upside now and, and go back to resuming the longer term uptrend or the, you know they could obviously stay below and stay in the short term downtrend that we're seeing. Uh, I don't think it really matters. I think there's a lot of other things that will affect the market. However, I do think uh, oil should now start to probably uh, retrace back a little bit. I think when you look at, uh, you know, the way that oil had gone up, and of course we saw the big breakout Thursday and Friday, and of course a big breakout for the week to three or four year highs. Um, when you look at that, you see that the, 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 the reason that they were running was based on fear, okay? Not based on fundamental data or not uh, supply and demand, but really they were based on fear. And that shows up in the pricing model when you see that May oil is more expensive than June oil, and June oil is more expensive than July, that just shows you that's called backwardation. That's a formation that forms in commodities when they're being driven by fear or, or outside noise, and that's what I think it is. So I would expect, uh, you know, and again, we, don't, we won't know until tonight, but I would expect oil to be lower uh, based on this formation something, unless something escalates throughout. But we go back and we look at last week's action, uh, markets were higher, uh, you know, for the week. We finished off with, uh, you know, them being softer. But overall, the markets are right at this, we'll call this the key tipping point. If you look at a weekly chart, you'll see that tra the trajectory is still lower. So if they fail here, then they're probably going lower. If they do break out, then that would be a chance that maybe the markets will turn around. Now, I don't see a lot of reasons for the markets to work their way higher. I still believe that the tops are in, which were put in, in, in January 29th. Uh, but again, I wouldn't be overly aggressive here either way. I think that you've got to watch and, and let the markets dictate to you what is going to happen next and what their mind is thinking. And basically that comes down to the flow of money. So right now we'll see where we've had a obviously a, a little pop last week, but we'll see how it does trade out this week. And I would again, I would not be too aggressive on either side of the market here. Sometimes there's a time just to kind of observe the action. And I think this is one of them because this is a, a key point in the markets, whether or not they're going to fail and go lower and take the lows out, or they have actually found the lows. There's going to be a, a, a series made for each one of those arguments. So we're going to watch and lean a little bit to the short side from here. You know, and one of the things that we, we, we see, and, and I always, you know, wonder, you know, we just got out last week the Fed minutes. Now, the Fed minutes are four weeks old already, three weeks old already. What what good are they? What's their what's their actual value? And their value of the minutes is the same as the value of the Fed. Zero. Okay. I mean the Fed has no value. The Fed has become a, a more of a, a, a crippling block into the, the economy and it's become more of a manipulation trying to continue to control and manipulate markets versus letting markets trade for themselves. You know, which 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 begs a question is is when will they stop and, and what is the end result here? And I think that's the bigger question. Again, we know one thing for a fact. If we go back in the history of the markets, the markets do go up over time. So again, I'm not saying that the markets are, are going to go straight down. I'm just saying that the Fed is, a, is trying to figure out a way out. And we know they have never made the right decision on whether or not how to get out and, and what to do with their, their exit point. So we'll see how it plays out. But I, I think there's a lot of things to look at. And of course, trade wars are still on the top of the docket. And, and I think we're starting to realize that the trade wars are not going to be as big a deal as everybody c continues to think they are. 
I don't think that they're a problem, number one, anyways. I mean, I've, I've said this in the beginning. I think that they can only benefit the United States. I think they can only benefit what we're trying to get done. And I think they can bring some true and real good jobs back to the United States of America. That's what I believe by watching this. And of course, when you look at the overall world of, of the dictatorship and of, of course, uh, Peng in, in China, uh, you know, he is obviously the dictator for life, but they need us. You know, they've got a lot of issues in, in China that we never get to hear about. You know, we only get this, usually the rosy picture, but they're trying to, you know, to pull off the triple Lindy basically with uh, trying to control their currency, trying to do everything else around it and trying to let things happen that cannot happen the way that they're, they're, they're doing things. But of course, they do hold a big portion of debt of the United States. And again, that's why I believe you're going to see this deal get worked out over time. And I think it's going to be better for everybody. I think that this is the, the, overall, the, the overall deal. When you look at the overall trade war or the potential prospect of it, it really is not going to be a disadvantage for everybody. I think it's going to be an advantage that actually puts us back to where we belong at the king of the hill without giving everything away to everybody. Because I think that's one of the big things we've had for the last, I don't know, 50 years, whatever it is. We continue to give it away instead of letting others earn for it and let us take care of it. I think that is the, the, the thing that needs to be changed in this country is not giving it away so easily, not giving it up so easily. Yes, we are the world power. And let's, let's show that we are the world power and let's let others come to us and make the deal work, not us always giving it away to let them work the deal. So I think that is, is something that we, we need to, to, to worry about. But of course, one of the big issues here is the, the Fed and the central banks that continue to try to manipulate currencies and they try to manipulate interest rates, which is, is, is only a way of, of trying to keep prices and competition open, which I think, again, is, is a, a disaster when you look at not allowing the free market system to work. This is one of the things that has always been a bugaboo with me is we need to have free markets to let them work the way they are because asset classes will price themselves. Not, I'm not going to price the assets. I mean, I could have an opinion of which way the market's going to go, but I can't price assets. Assets are priced through the price discovery model. All right. And until we let prices truly discover, we don't have a real economy. Again, we talked a little bit about this last week with the eight cents an hour raise for everybody. I mean, come on, that, that's, that, that's just a, a, a joke when we, when we look at the overall picture. But when you look at what's going around, and, and again, I continue to hear how great the economy is. I continue to hear all these wonderful things. So yes, we've seen a little bit of an increase in retail sales. All right. Okay. I mean, again, spending is spending. But again, is it real great spending? I don't see it. All right. I don't see great spending. I didn't see great profits. We had earnings over the weekend for the banks, well, actually on Friday. And the first set was, I mean, they beat, but did they really beat? And this is one of the things you have to look at is, is into a market. Is, is everything priced in? And did the, the, the beats, are the, is this going to be the way it's going to be that they're going to sell off once they report. You know, remember, markets are an efficient mechanism for pricing in news that is going to come out. Now, if you tell me that we continue to see that the markets have priced in 16, 17, 18 times earnings this year, and maybe we'll get there. Again, I don't really see it myself, but maybe we'll get there. But is that not already priced into the market? Are the markets already not priced for pretty much perfection? That would be something that I would have to look at and, and, and say that, hey, that should be pretty much where we are. So I'm not a big fan of thinking that the next leg up is going to come because of earnings, because, again, it's something we already know. When you know something, you've already priced it in, you've anticipated it. So that's something that, that I have to you know, be very cautious about, which goes back to why I'm thinking that observation is still the better track right here before getting too crazy, crazy away. I think one of the things you want to watch is the VIX or the volatility index. Now, volatility is collapsing right now again, and we're down in like the 17s. Well, of course, we were at 8, but we are down at 17. But a lot of the big commercials are massively short volatility, which is indication that they think markets are going to go higher. And again, I can't say that they won't go higher. 
I just say that I watch the pattern and watch a trajectory. So again, now markets can sit still and stay stagnant and go sideways, which would also crush volatility. But I think that volatility will be coming back, and I think this is <clears throat> more of a trade of a something that got overbought and too much volatility came in for what the markets could support. And I think you're now starting to see that that sell off. And I think that is something. Now, you know, if we go back and look at you know, a little bit of the, the, the trade war talk again, you see that the, the, the central banks will get very heavily involved if that happens, and they may go back to trying to control interest rates. Again, there's a lot of stuff that goes on here when we talk about the dollar as being our black swan in the market. You know, the, the, the manipulation and the, the holding down on the dollar has been one of the things that has been able to keep all of these things rolling, right? Because, again, when you're globally lending, and you look out in the outside, and of course, by the euro currency, you're getting a discount to cash when you're borrowing money. So I, I think that is something that just needs to be evaluated. But I think here, you know, with this new confrontation with, with Russia potentially, now again, I don't believe that we're going to have any major uh, military action with Russia or with China or with any of them. I think that everybody realizes that that's a zero sum game. That that if, if if it escalates, then that's the end of the world basically. So I think that they'll all manage and kind of come back into the fold. And I think that's what you should be more looking into. But you know, if we if if we look at just some of the things that are are around, and we see that volatility will tell you a lot of things about fear. Okay, and right now the markets are not showing or exhibiting any amounts of fear. Now, wouldn't you think if everybody was worried about what was going on with some of the geopolitical action, if everybody was worried about what was going on in Syria, if you know, because we knew that something was going to probably happen over the weekend in Syria, which is why I think you probably saw, saw a little bit of a sell-off on Friday is because, you know, who really wanted to go home long into a weekend? But again, the markets are pricing themselves out. But again, if there was really a reason that the markets thought there should be some fear, then volatility would be much higher and would have, wouldn't have gotten crushed on Friday, wouldn't have gotten crushed all last week. So I think that's something that we have to look at from that standpoint is the markets kind of know ahead of time. And it's, it's like if we look at oil, and I want to go back to oil for a minute. If you look at the price of oil and how it spiked last week, so now the action has taken place in the Mideast. Does that mean that oil is going to spike even further? My, my sense is no. My sense is that, you know, it'd be a great time to sell oil, especially if, it, if it's higher later, because I think what you've seen now is they've, they've already priced in the fear. You know, you go back and look at any great backwardation formation in any of these markets, and you'll see that typically the, the news is priced in. It's like if I'm looking at a chart and I see some weird movement, I say there's news coming, all right? And that's what, what I think the news is now going to hit. And of course, this is Sunday. So tonight at 6 Eastern, when the market's open, the news will be in the market, and then we'll see where it's going to tra trade. But again, that's something that you should understand, that markets are very efficiently pricing things in well ahead of time. In the meantime, this is Bubba's Bottom Line. I'm going to step out of a break, and I'll be right back with more on Bubba's Bottom Line. What's up, everybody? Listen, I wanted to remind you about my high school investing program. That is uh, highschoolinvesting.com. And if you want to check that out, please do. It's a great site, and we're out, out educating with about 450 high schools right now. And, of course, we'd like to do more, but we need some capital. And, uh, you know, after putting, after financing this for seven years and actually taking the burden upon myself, if you'd like to help out, you can go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Bubba Trading. Again, that's Patreon dot com forward slash Bubba Trading, and you can help us out. In the meantime, don't forget to catch the Bubba Show every single day at 4 to 5 Eastern at LibertyTalk.fm, and we're going to get back to the show. Welcome back to Bubba's Bottom Line, and it's me, Todd Bubba Horwitz, and of course, I hope everybody's having a great weekend. And you know, there's a couple of things that we, you know, that we, we look at, you know, it, it, in markets, and and as we we move forward, and of course, the, the, the trade wars have been a lot of bit of a, the, the talk, the some other things, but I'm going to talk about the cryptocurrencies a little bit. You know, one of the things about that is, you know, people 
the media, the pundits, they all hate Bitcoin. Why? Because it's the true free market. Okay. And it doesn't have to be Bitcoin. It can be cryptocurrencies in general. But why do they hate it? Because it's a true free market? Because you can actually do something with it that actually trades 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They can't get their hands on it, so they can't manipulate it. Is that why everybody hates it? Um, you know, again, there's, there's obviously talk from, from others out there uh, that uh, this uh, uh, Draper says, predicts that Bitcoin will be 250000 by uh, 2022. Now, again, I'm not making any prediction like that. I, I go one level at a time. But I would like to see it go back to its high, and then we could worry about multiplying that high by ten. But but I think the overall principle, the overall concept of the cryptocurrency world, is real. It's going to be real, and I think it's something that everybody should have a little bit of a representation in their portfolio. I think that one of the issues here is is that you're you, you're seeing a lot of it being used. You're seeing countries go to using Bitcoin as their currency. Now, there are small countries, but again, the reason that we're seeing some of the, I, th I think we saw some of the big selling pressure of recent until the end of last week when we rallied back a little bit, is there's tax selling. You know, if you made a lot of money on Bitcoin and you made it like through Coinbase and you got a 1099, you got to pay taxes. Well, all of a sudden, you know, where you can get the tax money from. So you had to sell into that to, to create some of that taxes. But I have no doubt that the cryptocurrency world is real. I have no doubt that the cryptocurrency world will be here forever. I have no doubt that, you know, one of them will be a, a more important currency. And again, you're seeing the very in many different uses for cryptocurrencies. Some of them have used as utility coins, some as a as a currency. So again, I, I think that the concept <clears throat> is correct. And the concept is going to work. Why? Because it is a true decentralized free market system that trades 24 hours a day. And that is something that I think that you want to look at. The other thing you want to take a look at is that you are now starting to see more ETFs coming into the equity markets regarding Bitcoin, which will mean options will be next because we've already got futures. That is lending credence to the cryptocurrency world as well. And I think that's something that you should say, hey, that does give some that that does lend some credence to what we're seeing. Again, everybody wants to call it a bubble. Everybody wants to care, compare it to tulip mania, and and I'm just saying, in my eyes, it may have very well been a bubble. It could still be a bubble, but even bubbles when they pop, like the internet. Remember what happened with the internet bubble? All right, it did pop in 2001, and look at it today. So that's something that I think that again. I would never recommend anybody going all in and buying a lot of it, but I certainly think that that you need to have some representation as to what these things are going to do and, and to be involved in some stage, all right? Because that's really where we come down to. Now, as we look into the commodity market, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we called for the bottoms in, in, in cattle and in hogs. And, of course, we have seen a nice rally, and I do think that they are now breaking out the upside, and I think that you're going to see better movement here. I think that we've, we've digested the trade war potential talk. I think that we have realized that it's really not that big of a deal because prices are moving higher. And I think that uh, the grains, again, although they did not have a great week last week, of course, soybeans had a pretty good week last week, but, of course, wheat you know, opened on its high of the week and corn. We rallied up big on Monday and then spent the rest of the week going down. And corn opened on its high of the week and spent the week going down where soybeans were higher. But again, if you look at the bigger picture, they're all in much better shape than they were since the last USDA, USDA report, having nothing to do with the trade war talk. And I think what you want to look at here is at, to be a buyer of dips as they fall, if they fall, and find certain key levels to go ahead and step in, in, in both cattle, hogs, and grains. I think that the commodity space is going to be the place to be. I think even though I expect a much higher dollar, which I do expect, I expect the dollar to break out. I thought it would break out over 90 when last week it did not, but I do expect it to break out. And I do expect it to see uh, par, which is a dollar, before the year is out. So we'll see how that plays out. But in the meantime, I think that the, the commodities, which are dollar denominated, have already priced in a lot of that, mar that information. So I think that that says to me that they're going to go for higher prices. And, and I, I think one of the things you have to look at now as well is, is, is this a bubble? And I, again, I do believe it's a bubble. I believe this is a bubble that was created by the Federal Reserve. 
okay, for the Federal Reserve. No, I think it was created by the Federal Reserve. But I have to ask you the question. So now you've got equities that I think are priced for perfection. You've got subprime mortgages coming back again. You've got an, you've got the obviously a record amount of debt in in the private sector. All right, you've got millions and you know the biggest credit card debt ever, the biggest margin debt ever. So what does that really mean? All right, that's why we look at this as a bubble is because you've got debts that are so high, which which begs the, the question is is how are we going to get out of this debt? Now, what in my eyes, what's going to probably have to happen at some point is there will be another collapse, and of course, the debt will a lot of will have to be forgiven. But you tie that into the flattening and the collapsing of the yield curve. You know, if you look at the twos, the tens, which is what they look at when you look at the curve, the twos are catching up to tens, all right, which means that the shorter term money is getting more expensive than longer term money, which is, is not a good sign. That is typically a sign of a possible recession. Now, again, from my perspective, I don't believe that we ever really left the recession as, a, as an average people. Yes, certain parts of the country had a big, a big boom. But I think when you look around, I don't know that we've actually seen the end of the initial recession. What we've seen is a manipulated market that continued to go up. And, I, and there's nothing wrong with that. Again, I'm long the market, so it's OK. But it, it's not something that I would look at from that perspective that it's actually really gone away. But so now we did not come out of this growth. We did not get the true natural inflation. Certainly, we got no wage inflation which is one of the biggest problems because people are not making money. They're making less money today than we're making 20 years ago. So again, that becomes another bigger part of these issues. There, there's so many things that tie in here that don't smell right. All right? You know, nothing really passed the smell test. Yes, I, I hear all the pundits and all the advisors and everything, but it's, it's, everything is great and corporations are great and, and certainly they are. But what about the average guy? What about the average farmer? What about the average worker? Who's taking care of their health care? You know, again, we, we, we seem to forget that these other co the costs that we can't afford to go up because we're not prepared for them are going up at a rapid pace. And that's the problem with the, the whole health care system and with a lot of the, everything else is that where is this going to go and where is this going to lead to? And that is the problems that I find. OK, and, and to bear that out more. OK, if you look at travel, everybody says how great travel is. Well, then, if travel is so great, how come hotel occupancy is down year over year? Okay, If travel is so great, why is hotel occupancy down? Why are we starting to see, you know, why are the airlines continuing to lessen flights? Because they're trying to, obviously, they want to fly full planes. I make that. But again, so if hotel occupancy is down and everything else is coming down that's related to that, then where is the great dramatic growth? That's, you know, again, that's where I always have a problem when, when we hear how good the growth is. And, I, and again, I don't have a problem. Just show me. Show me where the growth is, okay? I don't see it. And, of course, if there was that much growth, then the Fed would be, would be hiking rates. And if there was that much growth and the Fed was hiking rates, then money would be going into the bank so, they could, so people could go to a passbook instead of being stuck in the stock market where they don't want to be, which does create some more of this volatility. So there's a whole bunch of questions that are unanswered based on what, I, what we're being told. And I think that is one of the bigger problems that needs to be addressed is how do we get past all this? Where do we get it so we get a square up, straight up deal so we all kind of know? This is kind of like the blockchain. I'd like to see the whole general ledger of all these expenses and everything that we're seeing because, again, I don't see the massive growth that I continue to hear them tell me about, and, and I'd like to see it. I mean, obviously, it, it does all of this good if the country is flourishing. And I don't see the overall flourishing by the most. I see it by the, by the minority. I don't see it by the majority. And that, that again, I, I think is when you look at it, you, know, you, 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 you see companies like Walgreens cutting hours for their, their help. Okay. Well, what does that mean? If, if they're cutting hours and, and that means their business isn't that good. All right. So are we seeing growth because we're seeing elective spending or we're seeing growth because people have to pay more for things that they have to buy and i think that's one of the issues that i look at and one of the things that that, that trouble me is, is that the way the, the way that gdp growth is is a very funky way a very funky formula 
from the government that does not necessarily mean that even we got a 3% growth, that it was really a truly a great 3% growth. So there's a lot of questions in here that, that need to be answered and a lot of things that I think that, that we should be looking for. And again, not to be negative, because again, I believe that the markets you know, go up in time. But I think that there are times when it needs to have also a pullback and that's actually healthier for the market. And I think you're starting to see some of these asset classes like gold has been in a, like a three or four month straight sideways pattern, silver. Uh, you know, a lot of these have been sideways, which means they're getting ready to break out one way or the other. We'll make a decision. We'll see which way they're going to break, but we're not quite sure. Yet, based on what's going on, they're basically in that, that, that congestion, that turmoil pattern. And that will eventually break out and we'll get a better view. But in the meantime, I think that there's a lot of issues that need to be decided, but, and we'll see how they do trade out. In the meantime, this is Bubba's Bottom Line. I am Todd Bubba Horowitz. I'm going to step out of a break and come back with my commentary after the break. What's up, everybody? Todd Bubba Horowitz here. And of course, I just want to remind you about our highschoolinvesting.com uh, website. You know, we give away to any high school that wants a free program, a curriculum that they can actually teach kids financial literacy so we can maybe it, my kids and their kids can get out of this malaise and mess that, that, that's been created by the past. In the meantime, uh, if you'd like to help us out, you can go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Bubba Trading. And of course, don't forget to, forget to catch the Bubba Show every day at LibertyTalk.fm, 4 to 5 Eastern. And now let's get back to my commentary. Welcome back to Bubba's Bottom Line. Todd Bubba Horowitz with you. And of course, every week I get to do my massive bitch or a little bit of commentary. And, you know, I, I tell you, last week I was extremely frustrated listening to the news and listening to the pundits report on all of this information that was out there and on the trade wars. And, and I, I can't understand. Well, I do understand why. But the, all they did was preach the fear of the trade wars. All they did is preach how bad everything was. All they did is go back to want to talk about Smoot Hawley and about Reagan and about Bush. But they didn't, nobody ever took the bull by the horns and said, well, wait a second. Okay. Prices are actually higher than before we talked about the trade war. Markets are possibly moving higher here and we're limiting. And I go to the farm products first. And, and when I look at the farm products, the farmers have been under extreme pressure for 20 years, okay, because of a lot of the regulations, because of healthcare, because of all kinds of things. So, you know, I'm not so sure that, that they're going to be as, as troubled by the potential trade wars than, than, than anybody else. Again, I'm not, a, I'm not a big believer that the trade wars are a problem, but I want to know why is the media continuing to try to create this big ball of fear? Is our ratings that important that you have to talk it up like the world is coming to an end? You know, there was a years ago, there was a when oil was back in the hundreds. If you remember, oil went up to I think 160 at one time. And I got called by one of these networks that I've done some work for, and they said, We want you to come on and say oil is going to 300. And I go, I can't do that. I'm not, I don't believe that. So why would I want to do that? Again, I believe you have to watch the flow of money when you're looking at something and not try to get caught up with the hype. So I think that a lot of this stuff has been created by media to fear, to create fear, A, to create ratings for them and to create other things. But I think to me, that's the bigger problem. I think it's easiest to lay out the facts. And as I always like to say, you follow the money, okay? Because at the end of the day, the money is the leader. So for, for people that have no idea what they're talking about to try to create this fear that's been out there, to me, it makes absolutely no sense. And I don't say that I know it all. I just say that I tell it what I think. And I'm not looking to create fear or, or, or heartache to anybody about the news. And I think that's what goes with the lobbyists and with the, the politicians, because when they want to get what they want to get, they need to have this fear that's been created so they can go out and get and, 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 and shake down their people for more money so that they can try to, to get back into the, 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 the Senate and the Congress to try to get them to pass some stupid laws or to stop something. So to me, that is a bigger problem, and that's what needs to be stopped, and, and that would be the first area that we need to stop worrying about 
is the fear that has been created that gets created by the media, the imagination of the media, because most of us don't sit there and read and go through everything. We have a few minutes to catch the news or to catch something, and we get that idea that there's fear, and that's I think is is irresponsible reporting. I think that again, I'm not putting any network out, out in here, but I think that's irresponsible reporting. I think that is more problematic, and I think that is what needs to be stopped: is the fear that is created by the media in general over things that are nonsensical. And that is it for today. This is Bubba's Bottom Line. And of course, as always, I thank you so much for being here. We'll see you back here on Monday with Bubba's Daily Update. Everybody have a great weekend. Enjoy yourself. And I guess if you're like where I live or in the Midwest, stay warm and stay dry because it's either raining or snowing and freezing somewhere. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you later.